And I, I don't think um, I can remember an event uh, where I have greater pleasure, actually, in introducing our two extremely distinguished um, speakers. And we are exceptionally uh, fortunate to have them with us today. And uh, especially in the case of Professor Hunt, who managed to fight off the terrors of the French uh, air traffic controller strike, as indeed I can see at least two people in the audience who did similarly. Um, we have with us today two of the most eminent uh, historians uh, of our age. Um, and with their hugely influential and distinguished books, I think we're in for a very interesting uh, and stimulating afternoon, especially um, given that there is so much comparative engagement uh, between their work. We will, I think, uh, this afternoon very much be focusing on the global and what global means, and I suspect also uh, with a special emphasis on the 18th century. But, of course, their books and their ideas are, are so fertile and wide-ranging, I expect we may well leave the 18th century territories as, as well. And indeed, I, I do very much hope that the discussion that will follow um, will also be uh, as wide-ranging as possible. And I know both speakers uh, and the centre very much wanted to put an emphasis on informality as well. We have a basic structure. Um, Professor Hunt will be speaking first and then Professor Colley, but then we will open it up for comments and questions from the floor, uh, which will also, we will have a, we, uh, perhaps I'll explain now, <coughs> but I'll remind you at the time, there will be a, a roving microphone as well. We're mic'd up, I think, but there'll be a roving microphone so that we can record the discussion, and it might be a good idea for you just to introduce and say who you are before you ask your question as well, and take, put your hand up and then take the microphone. Mike, Professor Mike Roper is going to be our mic boy for the afternoon. <coughs> the athlete, <athlete> <laughs> Uh, speaking personally, I, I have to say also that uh, it's a, a, a really great delight to have um, Lynn Hunt and Linda Colley here who have written books which have been uh, absolutely made all the difference to me as a historian and I know to everyone in the room as well, not only, not only in terms of history but also of what history can mean, what it could be and for stretching um, the boundaries of the discipline. Lynn Hunt is Distinguished Professor of History and holding Eugene, and I haven't asked her how to pronounce this, is it Weber or Weber? I'm sorry. Or Eugene Weber. Weber. Weber, with one B. Uh, uh, eminent uh, endowed chair in modern European history at the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. And she's, of course, the author of uh, numerous distinguished um, books, um, most especially, I think, of the, uh, and I know um, many in the audience here uh, have um, used this as a Bible textbook in our classes, New Cultural History, which I think is as fresh today and stimulating today as it was when it was first published. And also, I might add, uh, a great um, boost to us who, some, some, who also edit books, perhaps not as distinguished at that, but feel, feel sometimes it's very hard labour, which is sometimes uh, undervalued. Another um, very important um, collection and edited book um, is, um, I've got them here actually, uh, The French revolution in global uh, perspective, which followed <coughs> from her politics, culture, and class in the French Revolution. And also an important book, I think, which we will perhaps, I hope, be coming back to today, the book, um, books which she co-authored, um, the book that changed uh, Europe. I also have to um, mention uh, Lynn's Inventing Human Rights, which uh, I have to confess came through the post to me uh, out of the blue one day and I looked at it and I thought how, how, how wonderful that it should have come but I'm not quite sure why uh, it, it should have come for me and she very kindly used some of my work in uh, developing ideas I'd never certainly thought of in terms of human rights and it became the basis here in Essex for a new course on uh, historical approaches to human rights in which I pretend, Lynn, that I'd thought of those ideas all along, but actually they're embedded in, in your book. Um, <coughs> now, following on from the French Revolution in global perspective, um, Lynn Hunt is, is, is currently working, well, has worked on, indeed, a, a book that is forthcoming, entitled Writing History in the Global Era. And the chapter that she sent to us in, adv in advance on globalization is um, a, a chapter from that book. Linda Colley is Shelby um, M.C. Davis, 1958 Professor of History at the University of Princeton. She taught, of course, at Yale, LSE and Cambridge before that, although more notably uh, she is a, a, a much uh, honoured graduate, an honorary graduate of this university um, as well. And welcome, Linda. 
Welcome back very much indeed. Uh, the author, of course, of, of Britons, um, a distinguished biography of Lewis uh, Namia. In 2003, uh, she published uh, Captives, Britain Empire and the World, 1600 to 1850, which um, not only in, in a way tests, I think, the viability of, of global history, but extends in a new way how one might approach um, a, 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 the history of, 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 of global reach, the history of, of empire, um, and really sort of exhibiting a reworking of transnationalism, I suppose, from the bottom up, in a way, uh, to extend uh, Lynn Hunt's um, thoughts on this in, 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 the, um, in her chapter, uh, and led in many ways directly to another, in my view, very great book indeed, The Ordeal of Elizabeth Marsh, um, an extraordinary um, history of, uh, in a way, I suppose, of, 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 of proto-globalization, in a way, from the bottom up. Uh, in her words, a global biography for our globalizing times, um, using a single life to interrogate, in fact, I think what Lynn Hunt calls uh, larger webs of identity. So that's certainly enough from me. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming, and I'll hand over to Professor Lynn Hunt. Well, first of all, thanks so much for coming out. I know it's a very busy time of term for you all. I'm not assuming that everybody has read the one chapter I sent along, uh, although I'm certainly not going to, at the same time, reproduce it either, because the idea is for me to not speak too terribly long, uh, because Linda Colley, of course, is going to have much to say, and also because we want to have a discussion, because after all, this is not me lecturing to a class of my 250 students in the history of Western civilization. It's a very different kind of venue, and I'm as interested to hear what you have to say as you might conceivably be interested to hear what I have to say. I want to thank James Raven and the Center for Social and Cultural History for inviting me. This is perfect for me because I think I'm kind of an exemplification of a general movement amongst historians from being a social historian. My first book is actually a social political study of elites in two French towns, a classic comparative study, why was one town revolutionary and the other town was not at the end of the old regime, the beginning of the French Revolution. The word culture probably doesn't even appear in the pages of that book. I began as a sort of classic social historian of politics and moved on to becoming a kind of cultural historian <laughs> of politics. And so this most recent project of writing history in the global era I got involved in because I noticed more and more talk of globalization. I noticed more and more colleagues working on I think what's probably most appropriately called transnational history uh, as opposed to global history. Uh, and I wondered what this was about and what it meant for the direction of historical studies uh, more generally. So that's how I got interested in it, not because I am a kind of newfound historian of the global myself, which I think might be a truer characteriz characterization of Linda Colley, who has worked more in this direction, much more in this direction than I have. So part of it was, what is globalization about, and is it, is it a challenge to the way we've been doing history in the past, and in what sense is it a challenge? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but first I thought I'd talk about the book that James was kind enough to mention on the French Revolution and Global Perspective, because I, I felt, frankly, if I was going to be interested in this subject that I should at least try out uh, the global perspective a little bit uh, on my own. I think partly, frankly, this was just a kind of peak, because I felt there was a certain amount of talk about global history there's a lot of talk in the United States, you probably know this, about world history because that is what is taught in kindergarten through 12th grade in the United States is world history. And one of the huge issues has been, well, what actually would that be? And how could you teach students the history of the world? And what does it mean that we have moved in that direction? Uh, so this, was a, this is a big issue. And, Part of my peak was a feeling that some of the talk about global history and world history was a way of saying that cultural historians worked on little things 
and world historians worked on big things, or global historians worked on big things, and there was a certain invidiousness to this language. So I thought it would be worth exploring. So with two colleagues, we got together a group of largely younger scholars to do a book on how would the French Revolution look differently if you took seriously a global perspective. Now, what we wanted to do, however, was not talk about how the French Revolution has a global impact, because everyone who's a historian of the French Revolution, especially if you do this field in France, believes that the French Revolution has a global impact. This is not news. Napoleon went to Egypt. He was hoping to go to India. He sells the Louisiana to the United States because of the problems he's having in Haiti. There's no question that there's a global resonance of the French Revolution. The issue is actually quite the contrary that we tried to deal with, which is how would the French Revolution itself look different if you thought about global influences on it? So the other way around. Because the French, in particular, in France, doing French history, you tend to think that actually nothing influences the French Revolution except developments within hexagonal France. <coughs> so the book, in part, and my interest in the globalization question, in part comes out of the remarkable rise of studies of Saint-Domingue. Robin Blackburn was virtually the only person who wrote about these subjects uh, in the previous 20 years. Now, all of a sudden, it is a very hot topic, especially amongst US historians of the French Revolution, to do the study of the Caribbean islands, and in particular, Saint-Domingue, the most important of them in the 18th century. So being an expert on the French Revolution, you couldn't really ignore the fact that there was this whole new body of work coming up on how the colonies influence France. So we tried to bring together people doing a variety of different things on this subject. And I decided to do an essay. People always ask me, how did you get interested in that topic? And I have to confess, I never know why I get interested in the topics that I get interested in. But for whatever reason, probably because globalization was in the air, I got interested, probably because it was 2007 or 2008, I got interested in foreign bankers in the French Revolution. Um, so I started looking into foreign bankers in the French Revolution, and then I got particularly obsessed with one, Etienne Clavier, who is a Swiss banker, who comes to England first, actually, and Ireland, tries to set up a utopian colony in Ireland, then ends up in France, and becomes fabulously rich. Well, it's actually not clear that he becomes fabulously rich, because he has actually fabulously great debts. But he manages to go from having nothing to having massive assets and massive debts uh, right before the French Revolution. And he's involved in what I then came to see as the, the financial origins of the French Revolution. Now, I didn't just talk about Etienne Clavier. In my essay, which is called The Global Financial Origins of 1789, I try to argue that the slave trade, the Indian Ocean trade, and the role of foreign bankers are all connected together, and that the reason the French monarchy falls is not because of its debt ratio, which is actually better than Britain's in this period, but because it has access to so much more new money being created by the massive expansion of trade after the end of the American War in 1783, that the French are able actually to borrow themselves into bankruptcy in the sense of borrowing more and more and more and more because of this rapid growth of trade. And I argue that foreign bankers play a key role in this because they organize the trade and they in particular organize the funneling of money to French government securities. So not surprisingly, since I suspect this often happens this way, it seemed like 1789 had a certain resonance with 2008 because, in fact, one of the things that's happening in 1787, especially 1786, 87, 88, 89, is the creation of whole new companies. Clavier is so interesting because of his experience in England, he brings back the idea of actuarial tables and sets up some of the first insurance companies, fire insurance companies in particular. And he is, so he's, involved in this kind of getting people to invest in new things. So in that sense, it seemed to me 
Uh, that was just one of the essays in the book. There are a couple of other essays on origins which also talk about how global trade is very much involved in the origins of the revolution, oftentimes in surprising ways. There's a wonderful essay by Michael Quass who argues that the smuggling of calicos and tobacco is a massive underground activity in the 1780s, and the government decides to try to repress it and this creates a kind of certain turning of public opinion against the government. So he makes a direct connection. The, the whole subject of calicos being an, an absolutely fabulously interesting question. Crucial, I would argue, to the slave trade, unappreciated, especially in the French case, for its role in the slave trade, along with the role of cowries in the French slave trade. And for, all of, for, all, for both the trade, bankers are crucial, and for the growth of dissent and <coughs> sort of turning a public opinion in France, what Quas is arguing is that this whole issue of foreign products will be key to the way public opinion changes in the 1780s. So we think we have some ways of showing how the French Revolution itself is a product of globalization. So it is precisely France's role in these newly global markets. I think it's, um, so one of the arguments I want to make in this book is that it does not make sense, I hope I do not insult anyone in particular here, to talk about the Atlantic as if it is a s enclosed system. I want to argue that, these that the Indian Ocean and, and Atlantic markets are totally interconnected in particular by calicos, uh, which are what are used which play an important role in buying slaves and are imported. The ones that African slave traders want are made in India. This is a huge issue for British and French manufacturing because they just are not able to make them in the way that appeals to African chiefs. So I got interested in how this is the Atlantic perspective, which is a sort of first move towards global history, I want to argue is really an incomplete perspective unless you show the various ways in which the different parts of the world are interlinked. And one of those important ways, I would argue, is through foreign bankers. It's not just the Swiss moving to France, which is very famous. I consider this actually the revenge of the Huguenots against Louis XIV. They, they actually dominate the banking institutions on the eve of the revolution in many respects. French Protestants, uh, Genevan Protestants do. Uh, but it's not just them. There are also French Catholic families that have important roles in Spanish banking. In fact, they set up the main new national Spanish bank, the Banco de San Carlos. Uh, this is a subject I think is vastly understudied, the importance of Spain to the global trade still even in the 18th century. Spanish silver imports are rising at the end of the 18th century. This is also crucial to the outbreak of the French Revolution. So this, this sort of, you can see how I wanted to show that even cultural historians can talk about economic issues because they actually also involve cultural issues at the same time, which have to do with foreigners, their role in elite circles, how this works. Clavier is so interesting because he's, I think, important in the French bankruptcy, writes extremely important treatises on why the new government must assume the royal debt being one of the people who has funneled all the money into it. This is not surprising. And he becomes the finance minister in 1792 under the Republic. So he's an extremely interesting link uh, between these various moments in the revolution. And someone who's really vastly understudied, there's sort of one 125-page <laughs> biography of, of him. All of his papers were confiscated because he was arrested during the terror. So what I did was spent a massive amount of time entering his registers into Excel sheets, calling my sister to have her explain to me how to do Excel sheets as I was going along, um, and trying to figure out what exactly was going on, which you can't do by just looking at the registers, which have you know, point by point entries. You really need to sort of see it in a kind of more quantitative fashion. So that was my own particular kind of investment, if you will, in the globalization question and, and, in, and in sort of getting French revolutionary studies to move more in this direction. On the other hand, I, I think it has to be said that though there are ways in which a global view can change the view of the French Revolution, there are limitations, and this is increasingly coming up for study. 
David Bell, your colleague, has written a fantastic essay, which will be published in a few months, I'm sure, on the limitations of the global view of the French Revolution, because there are all kinds of things that happened in the Revolution that just are not really amenable to that kind of analysis. The oath demanded of the clergy of loyalty to the new constitution, which is arguably the single most divisive and important turning point in the French Revolution, hard to explain in global terms. It is a country which is, after all, still 80% rural at least. The percentage of GMP provided by international commerce is actually very small. So there are going to be a lot of issues that cannot be explained in a global framework. And one of the really interesting challenges of the future will be to figure out how do these things go together? How will we think about the way we have traditionally done nation state history, if you will, in a global context without giving up some of the really important things about the nation state context? And I will turn to that now by talking briefly about this other book, Writing History in the Global Era because it's related in part to this question. One of the things that I was worried about with the rising talk of global history or transnational history was that some of the most important issues to me, anyway, as a cultural historian, as a, as a feminist, had to do with things that are very much located in the nation state in our time, such as citizenship rights, which are hard to, to approach in a global fashion, except comparatively, of course, it matters who has them and who doesn't. But the struggles for the right to vote for the laboring classes, the struggles for the right to vote for women, all kinds of issues about the way social life is organized, divorce, marriage, the age, of, the age at which you reach maturity or, or adulthood, these things all tend to take place in a nation state framework. So it seems to me that we wouldn't want everyone to go off in search of global topics, leaving behind all of the struggles about women's rights, minority rights, uh, and the place of the non-elite in the national fabric seems to me to be an extremely important subject. So this is one of the things that I was interested in. But in fact, to be entirely honest, and to put the chapter that some of you have perhaps looked at into context, I also wanted to relate this to my ongoing interest in the fate of cultural studies. So there's a first chapter that's, if I may put it in truly soundbite form, the rise and fall of cultural studies. Not that I think cultural studies is going away, but it's about the rise of criticism of cultural studies. Then the second chapter is on the challenge of globalization. Not to say that it's a response exactly to cultural studies, but to say that there are certain issues in cultural studies that made the rise of interest in globalization have a certain resonance. Not that it would displace the one, but in particular here, this is something I've been interested in for a long time, the fact that in most cultural history, and especially in cultural studies viewed more widely, there was a kind of reticence, if you will, about causal analysis and a certain kind of reticence about meta-narrative. This has to do with the fact that post-structuralism, post-modernism, whatever you want to call it, French theory, has a tremendously important influence on cultural studies, uh, much of it very much for the good, but if you take that position seriously, then there is it built into it a kind of suspicion of meta-narrative and a suspicion of causal analysis. And since I'm in a department in which these sort of two sides are represented very, very clearly at UCLA, it's actually a, a great advantage. I heard, I was our head long since been working on this book, but I heard a fantastic exchange. We had a retirement celebration for Carlo Ginsburg, the great historian of microhistory, and add it, I mean, only in America can these kinds of events take place. Our, his other colleague and good friend, Perry Anderson, got up and for his retirement celebration, denounced Carlo um, <laughs> for having refused to see the importance of causal analysis uh, and denounced basically microhistory as an endeavor altogether <laughs> for its inability to talk about the things that really matter in history. Um, so I was always, so I was interested in this tension between microhistory 
as kind of a, a fuller and fuller context and the sort of traditional issues of causal analysis. You know, because Perry's view was sort of like, he was in particular actually attacking a talk that Carlo gave about Mark Bloch. So actually Perry was attacking mainly Mark Bloch for not having offered a causal analysis of the origins of World War II in his book on the coming of World War II. So I, this sort of starkly posed the issue. Should we historians be talking about causes or should they be talking about how things happen and how they sort of take place leaving aside the causal analysis. So my view was that this is a big issue that cultural studies had not re resolved. What to do about cause and what to do about meta narrative. Maybe even what to do about narrative generally. So first chapter is on cultural studies. In a very short amount of space telling where it comes from, what it is and what's happened to it. Second chapter is about globalization and whether that is the new paradigm to replace cultural studies. And in that chapter, as some of you know, I try to talk about what I think are some of the defects of the globalization view, especially if it's viewed top down, because it emphasizes the macroeconomic uh, and definitely effaces many of the things that have been gained in historical research in the last 30 years. But they also argue there is a way of approaching it from the bottom up, which I think has an enormous amount of promise, not least because three of the great practitioners of it from the bottom up are actually in my own department at UCLA, Sanjay Subramaniam, uh, Sibu Aslanian in Armenian history, and the book I talk about a little bit in there by Sarah Stein on ostrich plumes and their trade and what it tells you about how things work. Um, so I think there is the promise of this kind of work of doing globalization from the bottom up, which builds actually from cultural elements. And this is the way, I think, not to efface microhistory, not to efface cultural history, not to efface the history of women and all the things, and the history of minorities especially. Of course, this is particularly striking. As Lanian's book is about Armenian merchants, Stein's book is about Sephardic merchants, uh, Francesco Trivolato's book is about Sephardic Jewish merchants. They're often about minority groups and their importance in creating global networks. So, so I, I see a, a tension between the different ways of approaching globalization. And then just to conclude, I would say uh, what the last two chapters are about, because they're probably even more problematic, uh, which is why I didn't send either one of them to you. Uh, the first chapter is on how, so then, so then when I raise this question and I say, well, globalization, maybe, maybe not, um, I then say that one of the things I think needs to be done and one of the answers is there needs to be in some ways even more cultural studies or cultural history, but of a certain kind. And what I want to offer then is a, I have a chapter on the concepts of society and self, where they come from, how they function in modern social science, all of this in 35 pages because we wouldn't want to go on too long about uh, such big topics. Uh, as a way of getting to the fourth chapter in which I have a critique of Foucault's meta narrative, I argue that it's incredibly influential and important because it is the counter meta narrative to the standard meta narratives of modernity, such as Marx, Weber, Freud, and Durkheim, all of which I consider incredibly important. But Foucault's is the great counter narrative, it seems to me, with certain elements of Freud and <coughs> Weber thrown in. And I argue there are problems with his narrative and that we need to have a different meta narrative. So I sort of sketch out what I would think would be a different meta narrative. And later on in discussion, if you want to ask for my two sentence summary of what my new meta narrative is, I can try to do it, but I think it would be insane to try to do it right now. Um, so I think the best thing for me to do is give the floor to Linda, see what you want to talk about, and we'll go on from there. Thank you. Hello. Um, it's a very great pleasure to be at Essex again and to have been invited to join in this discussion. And um, thank you, James, for inviting me. That historians, uh, along with others, 
need to improve their understanding of the connections and also the disconnections that have operated over time within the global human community seems to me self-evident. But that said, I'd like to make some observations and raise some questions, and I'll be talking in general terms, and to a degree I will be endorsing uh, what Lynn said, um, partly because I didn't know what she was going to say, so <laughs> such is life. Um, it is important to recognise that arguments for the importance of what we now style global history and meditations on what today we call globalization are not, in fact, new. Polybius was discussing some of these issues in the 3rd century BC. So, in 1731, was an utterly obscure Kentish vicar called Richard Spencer, who translated Bishop Bosway's late 17th century discourse on universal history, while also adding some thoughts of his own. Particular histories represent what things have happened to such or such a people with all their circumstances, Spencer wrote. But to understand the whole clearly, you must know what relation every history can have to others. Only that way, he insisted, would you be able to see all the order of time. Some 150 years later, when Lord Acton initiated the Cambridge Modern History, he stressed the importance of transcending nationality and stated that universal or world history, and he used them as synonymous terms, was different from and much more than the combined history of all countries. As far as I know, the first book in English to include in its title the phrase global history was published by Hans Cohn back in 1962 in a New York series called World Perspectives, which was intended to address, quote, our growing global age. So these arguments and emphases have been around in different ways for some time. So what, if anything, is new now? The extent to which discussion of these issues has become more widespread and much more emphatic is owing, I would suggest, to at least three main factors. First, the accelerating consequences, real and perceived, of decolonization. I think that's very important. Second, of course, the coming of the World Wide Web with its transformations both of knowledge gathering and potential audiences. And third, the influence of scholars such as Said, Spivak, Chakrabarti, Balibar, many others, who in different ways have stressed the importance, the desirability of provincializing Europe and the West and the need to reassess and assert the importance in human developments over time of uh, actions, forces, ideas occurring outside those particular parts of the world. These academic arguments about provincializing the West, provincializing Europe especially, have of course piggybacked on and been reinforced by the progressive post-war decline relatively of Europe and the contemporaneous resurgence of the great Asian powers and the rising influence too of some parts of Latin America, the Pacific world and Africa. However, it's worth noting that even though this 
there is a new emphasis on global history, globalization. There have, in fact, been marked limits and also marked differences in the take-up of these ideas on the two sides of the Atlantic, which are the parts of the world I know best. In an article published in the American Historical Association's Perspectives this May, Luke Clozzi, I think that's how you pronounce his name, but I wouldn't know, he's a Canadian historian, and Nicholas Gouillat, who works at York, calculated that three quarters of the historical research being carried out in Britain and Ireland and in North America as a whole was still, still being devoted to Europe and North America. Having examined 60 history departments and 2,400 historians in the UK, US and Canada, that must have been fun, Guyatt and Clossy also found, however, that scholars here in what some would call the UK, we had a discussion about this over lunch, were more Eurocentric and more nativist than their American and Canadian counterparts. This is what they calculated based on their research. Whereas a third of US scholars worked on American history and a further 29% on Europe, they calculated. In the UK, over 40% of historians worked on domestic histories, while another 36% focused on continental Europe. Now, we might, as, as the afternoon goes on, want to discuss the implications and meanings of these apparent divergences in historical practice and interest and what they may indicate about the continuing significance of national and geographical and, indeed, political differences. Um, it seems to me quite likely that different levels of take-up of global history in fact confirm the endurance of important regional and national distinctions. Uh, we don't all approach history in the same way, even if we're all interested in global history. For example, what seems to be a greater openness to non-Western history in the United States is surely due in part to the fact that America is still a world power. Um, there's a sort of element of vested interest there. It's historians' greater extroversion, or what seems to be their greater extroversion, may also reflect the fact that the United States has a markedly shorter known history of its own to address than do the countries of Europe. Um, if you want to be a historian of medieval America, you really have to be an anthropologist or an archaeologist. There's not that many documents surviving. Um, so, you know, American scholars uh, with a shorter time frame of their own, perhaps, therefore, are doing more things in regard to other places. It may also be important that from the 18th century at least, many Americans have nurtured a belief that Europe and Europeans are perhaps a little unworthy and suspect and should damn well be provincialized. Uh, I, I'm sure that part of the take-up of the idea of the provincialization of Europe, whatever you think that means, uh, in America, among uh, some of my dearest colleagues, uh, you know, it picks up, think of some of Henry James' novels, for heaven's sake, uh, this sense of Europe being 
somewhere else, somewhere that should be regarded with a certain amount of skepticism, uh, other parts of the world looked at instead. And certainly there's no doubt at all that growing interest in global history in American universities um, has been accompanied very often by a reduction in recent decades of the number of jobs, the number of graduate scholarships, uh, the number of uh, lecture attention to European history. Uh, you can see that uh, really all over the United States. Um, and I don't think, if I may be so bold to say, that it's entirely accidental or merely a question of intellectual curiosity uh, that Lynn, who is a French historian at the beginning, and I, who started out as a British historian, have moved on to uh, a wider interest in global history. This isn't just, I believe, a matter of intellectual choice, uh, being at one with the zeitgeist. Uh, I think, to an extent, we have been encouraged to repackage ourselves. Uh, certainly, you cannot teach British history in American universities in the same way that you can teach British history here. You have to widen out. Uh, it's now expected. Um, and I think, you know, this is, this is what's happening. Uh, it, it carries with it certain problems and challenges, which I want to go on to later. Um, and as this perhaps suggests, I am personally resistant to and skeptical of the notion of historical research and intellectual inquiry being governed by any single or dominant paradigm, however important and valuable it may be. And even those of us who do, as I do, work on varieties of global and transcontinental history need, I believe, to watch out for a possible loss of attention to different kinds of distinctiveness. Um, and let me touch just on two aspects of this, and I'm partly uh, endorsing here some of the points that Lynn made. Self-described global historians, even by the general standards of this profession, are at present overwhelmingly male. And when I read, with great profit, some of the great synthetic global histories that have been written in recent years, just occasionally I sense a barely suppressed note of relief that scholarship is now reverting to the real macro, one might almost say macho stuff of the past, transcontinental movements of capital, the movements across continents of armies, the rise and fall of empires, transnational commerce and <coughs> finance, uh, heroic and failing explorations, uh, the transmission across continents of great ideas, and so on and so forth. Developments which were usually caught up and associated with highly educated and or highly wealthy and or highly aggressive chaps. And obviously I'm sending this up slightly. Um, these conspicuous actors, as for example in, in Chris Bailey's recent very interesting work on 19th and 20th century transcontinental liberalism, may now sometimes be non-white. But they are still in the main highly educated and or highly wealthy and or highly aggressive men. Um, manifestly such actors are very important. But as Lynn has already said, we've therefore got to be careful in evolving global histories that in giving greater attention to conspicuous transcontinental developments, 
We don't, in the process, push aside or ignore the work of earlier generations of social historians, subaltern historians, women's historians, etc. Um, and obviously what I tried to do in, in my last two books was to play with notions of a kind of global history um, while incorporating uh, people much more at the bottom of society so that captives uh, focused very much on poor whites and some poor blacks. Uh, the ordeal of Elizabeth Marsh looked at a particular mixed and itinerant woman and her family. Um, not just including stories of disadvantaged individuals within global histories, but employing the former stories of individuals to thicken, to nuance, and to test the latter global history. Because I think this is important, apart from anything else, for issues of perception in the past. When we look at transcontinental developments in the past, uh, documenting them is one thing, but it's also important to establish how much people at the time perceived that this was happening, uh, and what sort of people were able to perceive the fact that this was happening. Uh, and, and that really needs to be tested on, uh, at an individual level, at least to a degree. Global historians also need to be attentive to specificities and to the distinctiveness of place in regard to particular processes over time. Richard Spencer, the obscure 18th century Kentish vicar I mentioned earlier, put it this way, in the order of ages, we must remember certain times memorable for some great event and action to which we are to bring all the other. This we call an epoca, from a Greek word that signifies to pause upon, because we stay ourselves there to consider as at a place of rest. One of the consequences of some historians discarding what Lynn has styled the straight jacket of nation-centered history writing has been that some of the once classic epoca, and especially those associated with the West, have been at once simultaneously opened up and rendered less distinctive. Uh, sometimes I think excessively so. For example, the 18th century industrial revolution used to be analyzed as a largely British phenomenon, at least in its initial decades. But now historians are much more likely to stress the importance of what Ken Pomerantz calls ghost acreage, uh, the role of the Caribbean slave plantations in terms of product and labor, uh, knowledge and techniques in regard to textile industries taken from Asia, arithmetical and fiscal techniques borrowed from the Dutch, etc., etc. By the same token, as she was describing, Lynn and other scholars have put together a truly wonderful set of essays on the French Revolution in global perspective. And in general, I think this is great. It's, it's all to the good. But it remains important, to paraphrase Richard Spencer, to retain particular places and times to rest upon and pause upon. However many far-flung threads wove into the French Revolution, it remains the case, I believe, that events and ideas in Paris in the late 1780s and early 90s and in other parts of France were indispensable. And while Britain certainly did not generate the first mineral-based industrial revolution solely out of its own indigenous resources, 
there were nonetheless systems of knowledge, governmental practices, patterns of investment and law, networks of entrepreneurs, scientists and activists, and certain economic infrastructures within Midland and Northern England and Lowland Scotland that were peculiarly developed in the 18th century and indispensable to what we know as the early Industrial Revolution. All of which is to say that one cannot construct a sound and informed global history without a strong basis of different area studies, without having available experts on particular regions, countries, continents, and oceanic and maritime places. The general will always have to draw upon and acknowledge the particular as well as enhancing and contextualizing it. That being so, academe everywhere, I think, will face certain strategic challenges. And this is the last thing I want to say. How, at present, and even more in the future, are we going in centers of learning to foster new work on previously neglected free regions and peoples while still sustaining expertise on more well-trodden and traditional areas of the world? How do we provide for the collaboration between different sites of learning that is going to be needed to do this when universities and academies are increasingly supposed to compete against each other and when resources are shrinking everywhere. It should surely be possible, it's going to have to be possible in the future, given that no university, no place of learning can cover remotely all as history widens out. It has to be possible for, say, University A to focus on new appointments in African and East Asian history, say, while University B keeps French history going at an advanced level and American history is kept vital and blossoming in University C, and so forth. Uh, and so that graduates can shuttle between these universities uh, and classes be beamed on the net from one to the other. I mean, this shouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility, but it's going to need a lot of rethinking in universities that normally do their own thing and are encouraged to compete against each other. Finally, how do we encourage students and researchers to adopt and value multiple paradigms? Um, we do need to encourage our undergraduates, uh, I'm sure we all know this, but I'll say it anyway, uh, not just to go to the flavor of the month or the flavor of the year or the flavor of the decade courses, of course global history is at present increasingly fashionable, but um, they really have to do some other kinds of history as well. Uh, we need to look at synchronic developments, synchronic modernities. Uh, of course, we need to stop, we, most of us have stopped thinking of what the West gives and directs to the rest. Um, but I'm not sure we want to provincialize the West or Europe. As historians, I don't think we want to provincialize anywhere. Uh, we want a more acute and informed and nuanced understanding of synchronic developments. Thank you. I'll ask Lynn whether she wishes to respond, but you may wish or to integrate your response into the 
Audience, or would you like to respond? Uh, to well, let me just say, uh, I would just say a couple of things. I think that one of the issues, to me, one of the issues that came up uh, when, I, when I was listening to Linda offer her, her incredibly interesting remarks is that, one, is that one of the underlying issues that perhaps we don't talk enough about, at least in history departments, is that part of this has to do with a kind of constant evolution, but now a dramatic one, in, in what it is history is for. In the 19th century, arguably, it was straightforward. It was elite men learning exempla from Rome and Greece about how to be great political leaders. So what you should study was perfectly obvious. Uh, in the 20th century, you could argue that the rise of history as an academic discipline also accompanied the rise of history as the narrative of national cohesion. And in this regard, I would say what is really striking about that, because I've actually looked into this a little, is how much more nation-centered history writing is in the non-West. Or Australia. Look at it. I looked at Australian National University. Virtually no, no one doing non-Australian history. Talk about a short history. Um, look at China, slightly more orientation towards the outside world. In India, not very much. So it's not as if Europe is particularly striking in its, its connection to national history. This remains obviously, so what I'm saying, in the 21st century, national cohesion still remains obviously an important element, especially in newly independent nations. I looked at Ukraine. It has nothing but Ukrainian history, almost, almost. I mean, you could see, there's hardly anything but Ukrainian history because it's seen as having a, a distinct national. I think one of the issues we're talking about, in other words, is what is history for in the future? I think, it's, I think it still is about national cohesion. But it's also about, if you're going to have a democratic form of national cohesion, it's about questioning your past, learning that you left out all kinds of things. Um, and I think it's an open question about what it's supposed to be for in the future. In terms of the US and why this is so big there, it's, uh, I, I think that Linda said some very important reasons, but left out one, and that is that in the US, this openness to world history has to do with the fact that our immigrant pool has changed. It is no longer European, so our kinship with Europe is no longer the key element in American identity. We have students from everywhere. And one of the really good side effects of this, along with a rising interest in the rest of the world, is actually a shift in what we mean by Europe. Because of the Hispanic immigration to the United States, there is now an increasing interest, for example, in Spanish history. Now, no one can say that Spanish history, for example, in the early modern period was not important. But it fell out of favor. It wasn't taught. Everyone had British, French, and German history because those were the problems of the 20th century. The German problem and how to ally with the British and the French to take care of it. Then the Russian problem. Spain, minor. Now it's coming back because Spanish medieval history includes Muslims and Jews, and everyone is more interested in that. So some of the recalibration ha has to do, I think, with the way in which identities have changed in nations, so that if, it e if it's about national identity, it has to shift somehow. And, and I think this is a good thing. It means that we're in a very interesting period of trying to think about what it's for. Unfortunately, it coincides with the same period in which legislatures all over the Western world are increasingly dubious about universities and especially humanities. Uh, and so our sort of self-doubts are perhaps better sh shared amongst ourselves, although there is one <laughs> dean here I know, um, rather than shared <coughs> with a broader public <laughs> it, 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 at the moment of agony. But I do think this is a really important part of the discussion, which is what do we think we're doing and what is it for? Thank you. And can I throw it open to the floor and invite comments and questions and Mike is roving to the mic and uh, if you could just say who you are at the very beginning please. Robin. Robin. Ava. Robin. Cool. Ava. Um, well that was, the, that, those were two fascinating um, introductions to this um, very topical Can subject. you hear in the back? And no. no. Uh, okay. Fascinating uh, contributions to this uh, enthralling topic. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to do was to pose really uh, as a, 
a question whether what lies beyond seeing the limits of globalization as a framework and of the national historical context as a, uh, um, as a type of history is um, the different types of articulation there can be between the national and the global because uh, they aren't just antagonists or alternatives. They're actually interweaved. And uh, I, I wanted to sort of mention off, th off the top of my head simply because I recently was consulting it, Reynal's uh, famous Histoire des Deux Mondes, which could, published 1770, it could be, but I'm not sure about Bozoway or Walter Raleigh or other people, but it could be the first real attempt at uh, uh, an accounting of globalization. Uh, and in fact, the first two paragraphs are a stunner if you've s sort of bear in mind that they totally anticipate Marx and Engels's paragraphs that open the Communist Manifesto. I mean, they're, they're saying here, you know, we now are linked one to the other. People in the Arctic are drinking sweetened tea. And, you know, it, it just goes through uh, uh, the shock of the global. But really, the book as a whole, uh, which is a vast, sprawling work and by different hands, uh, but there are, uh, if you ask what's he really trying to do, uh, or what are they trying to do, uh, well, the, there would be various answers to it. But I think one element that would apply particularly to Reynal himself, uh, I mean, he was trying to orchestrate Diderot and uh, Peshmeha and lots of others, uh, but uh, his concern was a sort of national concern. So here's a arguably the first global history, or uh, certainly an important early text of global history. Yet the, the, uh, the animating purpose is that um, France has been, uh, in effect, um, checked, uh, uh, if not outright defeated, in the Seven, seven Years' War. And uh, there's something about the other nations, and in particular the English. They seem to have got hold of something. They seem to be doing things more effectively. And you know, our slave plantations could be better run uh, 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 if we took a few hints from them. We can then do better than them, but the, the idea of rivalry is there or, or sort of competition. And so uh, what I'm suggesting is that there's a global <coughs> conception of the national, and it would sort of go the other way around. Obviously, that book, then, uh, 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 you know, there are passages that warn of slave insurrection and uh, a new Spartacus arising and how there's a danger that the different powers, uh, that there are dangerous new ideas abroad and they'll use these ideas to fight wars with one another and this can sort of disturb and upset uh, everything. Uh, uh, um, so I, I, I just feel that there's a nexus here of the global and the national and uh, that in a way, uh, while I very much share the idea that not all of European history ought to be provincialized, but there is a sense in which every national history, I mean, it's a pretty important exercise in a way to provincialize it, and it, it's a little bit dangerous to allow e any national history to be not provincialized, because it means it's a sort of national messianism of we can save the world, uh, which is uh, the kernel of quite a number of national ima imaginations, but uh, uh, maybe mm. the provincializing impetus is quite good, so long as it's in a context of, you know, this wider context of, of the global. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think so. I, I mean, I, I, there, there, are, there are many things to say about Raynal, uh, which we should perhaps not linger on. Amongst other things, he's extremely anti-Spanish and Portuguese. It's filled with how horrible they are to their slaves in comparison to the British and the French. Uh, what I think it shows is that, the, what your, your, your point is though, it's the interlinking between the nation state part and the global part. And I think that's very important. But there are various ways of still of approaching that. I mean, I think that's one of the great things about Chris Bailey's book on the birth of the modern world is that it's filled with analysis of how the increasing power of the British, ironically, actually, because he doesn't really draw attention to the irony here, the increasing 
important, especially once the French Revolutionary Wars show how powerful national armies can be, it leads to stronger state formation in the rest of the world to try to counter what is seen as one of the advantages of a strong state formation. Now, ironic, ironic I say, he, he doesn't really appreciate, uh, however, how much these th two things, the global and the national, are in a sense super tied together. So, and I think that's one of the areas that people are going to look at more. With the interest in global history, there has been much more interest in empire as a form, which was in you know, the history I grew up with in university. It was like, well, you know, the British and the French discovered the virtues of the national form, so the Germans and the Italians took it on, and obviously the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire couldn't possibly exist in the modern world because they're not modern forms. But now we're realizing that the nation state form itself has a certain brittleness to it, and that it never was really a nation state, as is more than ever apparent in the UK, <coughs> but in many other places as well. So I think it's just, it's, this is a really interesting nexus to look at, and then when we all just did our own national histories, in my case, French history, in the way it was being done at the time, this question somehow didn't get asked, which is why I agree with you that the, provincializa the provincializing move, I say I wouldn't call it provincializing though exactly, the move of recognizing the interdependence of the nation states with a variety of other forms, some governmental and some of other forms, like diasporic communities, uh, is really, will, will be an incredible move forward in historical studies, because it's a truer version of the way the past operated, whereas our national histories tended to be very sort of, oh, we did it all ourselves, and aren't we great, by the nature of the form. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously one of the great challenges is the extent of our knowledge. We are all very limited in what we know, and the more one moves into what is called global history, in my experience, the more one has to become parasitic uh, on the expertise uh, of others, uh, because you know there's, there's only so much you can do. Uh, and it, it's easier, in a way, to take an intermediary path and really to link, certainly if you're a British historian, to link the national and the global by saying, OK, I will do the empire, because sort of that, that keeps me rooted in my area of British expertise, and I can move out. And that's, that is often how a kind of global history was, ha, has happened in this country, through imperial history courses. Uh, <coughs> and that's fine as far as it goes, but what one needs, ideally, is to make the further leap uh, and uh, to let go the specific anchor mm. and be looking at what is happening across the globe in different places. How are these things connected or mm -hmm. not? For example, uh, Chris Bailey in the book you mentioned talked about the importance of uh, fiscal crises in the last quarter of the 18th century, in part caused by increasingly expensive warfare, and how that's leading to revolution in different parts of the world. And it's a very clever uh, chapter in, in his book. Uh, and it may be connected with that, that in the 1770s, 1780s, you're getting great powers across the globe investing much more attention to the manipulation of print. So the 1770s and the 1780s sees uh, an explosion at one level of printed political constitutions. Uh, it sees London setting up the stationary office to synchronize the production of official print. It sees uh, China producing printed surveys of language in the different parts of the Chinese empire. It sees the East India Company devoting huge printed efforts to surveys of uh, grammar in the different parts of uh, the subcontinent. Now, it, are these things linked? Are they just accidentally coincidental? 
Um, it seems to me these are the kind of really intriguing issues that uh, future global historians can look at. But unless you work as a group, it's hard because you know, how, how could anyone command a sufficient level of expertise? Uh, may I like to intervene on that? I'm just going to ask a particular question because Linda particularly says print, so immediately I come in on that. I think, I think I've got, I, I think I'm all right. Um, I'll make it brief, but I, I'm interested in, in the way in, in which we've also been looking at pragmatics and practicalities of this, in fact, of doing research as well as thinking about the practicalities of boundaries, national boundaries. To some extent, it seems to me what you're saying is also is a breakdown, what we're also looking at, whether we're talking about transnational or global history, we're talking also about the breakdown of boundaries. And if we think about the breakdown of boundaries, there may be different, I don't know whether the word is registers, but different ways of actually thinking about how we start, how we, how we proceed. Because if, if in the realm of the history of ideas and of, say, claims to universalism, that was in Lynn's chapter and that we might be thinking of in terms of a global, global history of ideas, claims to universalism, toleration, rights, and so forth, there aren't so many boundaries to break down. Mm. But if we start mm. with um, emphasis even from textiles or some of the things which we're talking about in national histories, there are very clear intellectual and pragmatic boundaries to break down from the terms of where people did where people were, how they were funded, what, what, the, what the area is. In my own particular area, the short title catalogues for print were nationally conceived things. Um, and on top of that, we've got this area, as Linda was saying, about gaps as well. We've got the problem that, you know, therefore we've got, to, to, we've got the pragmatic problem that there are whole issues we cannot respond to because we do not know, because coverage is uneven, and we also then have to piggyback on works of, 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 of others. But it seems to me that there is, uh, there's an, there, there are different sort of, as it were, registers here, if that's the right word, which intersect with boundaries in different ways. So, for example, universalism and history of ideas and so forth doesn't have so many boundaries. Certain, certain um, aspects of, say, na national histories that then become imperial history or, or global history clearly are crossing boundaries. They are trans in various ways. But perhaps histories which have an element of material culture which start, I don't know, with the idea of print or books or literature or something, also have fewer boundaries. It seems the boundedness might be an issue here. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Mm. Ava. Ava. Okay. I, I have a question. Why is uh, into the mic. It's Ava. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Who are you? So both, both uh, can you speak into the microphone? Uh-huh. And say who Better? you are, Ava. Huh? Say who you are. I'm Eva Moravska, sociology. I wanted to ask both of you whether you by any chance, whether you have tried by any chance in what you're working on, the issues you talked about, uh, Roland Robertson concepts of the glocal and glocalization, which I believe very elegantly account for both, as Lynn called it, big things and little things, or the local and the global as, as they interweave with and thus transform each other, it seems to me that rather than debate it, debating it as either or, one could try the notion of the global and globalization. End of question. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in this, I and mean, that's why in my <coughs> chapter I cite the work which I consider absolutely uh, a, a model of Marcy Norton who tries to explain the glo uh, I, I think explains quite nicely the globalization of chocolate as a commodity by starting with this extremely important question of why, why did people want to have it, uh, which shows that you, 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 you're not going to have globalization unless somebody wants something. And she argues strongly against the notion that chocolate is just inherently tasty and has a great I think argument about how the Spanish conquerors, not right away, but eventually learned to like with the way chocolate was prepared in the New World from their maids, from their concubines, from their wives, from their servants, and then brought this back to the New World. In other, and so that's a perfect example, it seems to me, of how you cannot understand <coughs> globalization unless you can understand why locally it matters to people. And so, so you have to have this kind of incredibly fine-grained analysis of, of how it works. I think you have, let's put it this way, you can have other explanations of globalization, but I think this is a more compelling way of looking at globalization because it shows how real people contribute to the process, perhaps not knowingly, but create this through the networks 
that they create. So I, I think there's an enormous amount of promise from doing it that way. You know, but that brings to mind something that, you know, this is the, this is, it's a trade-off question. Because the Bailey book, and you mentioned this particular section, which is very interesting on the financial crises that are similar all over the world in the end of the 18th century. But he relies, of course, because he has to, on an utterly hackneyed and potboiler explanation of the French financial crisis, because he's trying to t he's talking about the Safavids and the Ottomans and you know the Mughals and everybody at the same time. So he has to use the kind of going explanation available in each one of these histories. So innovation happens sometimes through comparing work in this way, it, but it also occurs sometimes by re-examining questions that were supposedly already answered like why there is a global trade in tobacco and, cho and, and chocolate. So I, I think you know, the, we need the tension between these two things to keep yeah, things going. The global yeah. Experience yeah. Yeah. I agree. Attention. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I, and uh, I mean, you, you can perceive the trend very often where as places get drawn into closer proximity uh, or ideas are transmitted, you, you often get thereby the invention of new divergences, the invention of new divergences. Uh, I think, for instance, of um, uh, anti-colonial nationalists uh, in the 20th century. Uh, you know, w one of the things that's happening in the 19th century is that Western dress for men uh, is, is spreading, uh, so suits, ties, shirts, uh, you, you find in more parts of the world. So one of the things that has to happen or, or is chosen to happen uh, by some anti-colonial nationalist groups is, is a, a, a reversion or a partial reversion to indigenous dress. Uh, so that confronted by sartorial globalization, you, you choose to stress your distinctiveness. In some cases, you invent a distinctiveness which may not have existed before. Or a new project, an artist. Yeah. Um, how far do you think um, your dichotomy between national history and world history merely reflects the, the fact that you're modernists and that you therefore see history in terms of the nation state. Um, medievalists don't see history like that. Um, and uh, histories, historians of imperialism um, have long um, been um, confronting uh, Syed's uh, criticisms of, um, uh, of Orientalism. Um, and I just don't recognize this, um, this dichotomy between national history and world history. It doesn't seem to me, it seems to me be in the modern history period, uh, but it seems to me in other periods it doesn't make much sense. Um, I, you know, I think your point is, is, is very well taken. Um, uh, certainly, I mean, I mentioned Polybius in the third century BC and his perception that uh, everything was becoming the same. Now, of course, it wasn't, but it was interesting that he thought that was a comment on uh, imperial expansion at that time, moving into different continents. Um, and of course, medieval historians, um, as you say, uh, though I don't know, I mean, mm -hmm. even yeah. so, uh, quite a lot of medieval historians get caught up on particular dynasties, particular kingdoms. Uh, as always, it depends on the historian. But the, the challenges of adopting, um, you're absolutely right, the challenges of adopting a more global framework, if that's what one wants to do, uh, is are going to change uh, depending on one's chosen chronology. Um, clearly, you're quite right. We, we have to engage with the nation state more than, much more than a medievalist would do, much more than an ancient historian would do, obviously. Um, but I still think that whatever chronology you look at, um, some of these issues are, are going to crop up. Right, because the issues, I'm, I completely agree with you. I, mean, I think, because the issues are, they still are shaped by 
certain desiderata. So, for example, not that I am an expert in medieval history, but French medieval history has often been preoccupied with, it, 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 not now, but in the past, with two things. One was the origins of the modern state in the various different forms, the, for, the beginnings of bureaucracy, however rudimentary by our standards, uh, all the things that would lead to the concentration of power in the hands of the ruler, how they managed to struggle with all the other competitors. This is very much shaped by the nation state framework as was also the interest in land tenures, which was very much shaped by the kinds of social issues that were dominant in the 20th century. Why are the peasants the way they are in this part of France as opposed to that part of France? What are the systems of land tenure? And how is this related? How is feudal society in the great Marxist schema related to what comes after. So I think they, these questions were often shaped by this. And I think even in medieval history, the questions, again, not being in medieval history, have begun to shift a bit. There is more interest in intercommunal relations between Jews, for example, and Christians, or Muslims, Jews, and Christians in the case of Spain. There's more interest in Spain than there used to be. It was British, Italian, German, and French medieval history that were, not, not that they were histories of those states, but that's the places where people want to study. To a certain extent, they studied Spain, but not to the extent uh, that I think is currently being the case. So there, there are ways in which even, even the areas which are not dominated by the nation state in the past have been influenced by these kinds of developments, including the sort of import of information from other cultures into Europe in ways that was perhaps not as much appreciated in the past. As, as now there is a much greater emphasis upon it. So I think even in that case, there's been an influence even though the nation state is certainly not the sort of shape that, uh, uh, by which all these things take place. It was notable at the recent conference organized by Ken uh, um, Patrick O'Brien and Ken Pomerantz at the LSE that, I don't know what you've described as medievalists, but certainly those from the 11th century, say the 15th century, discussing tra uh, technology exchange around the world and ideas around the world, yeah. it was marked, yeah. it was marked yeah. by the ignorance between East and West and, and, yeah. and, and scholars there from the East and scholars yeah. from, from Europe and yeah. America had not, had had very, what we might think of as conventional and, and were exchanging ideas for the first time. Um, Pam Cox, Lynn, you said in your talk, if we wanted to ask you for your two sentences on <laughs> life after the meta-narrative. You weren't we meant could to ask remember you, that all this long. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I'd, I'd like <laughs> to ask you about that. Well, I mean, you, you said your book ends with a critique on Foucault's view of the meta narrative. So, where next for cultural history? Oh, but I think there are, there are many places where cultural history is going besides where I'm going. I'm, I'm, it's not at all clear to me that anybody is going in, in, the, in the place where I'm going. No, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, one of my interests has always been in the question of the self. I have been always interested in psychoanalysis. I am now interested in neuroscience. I have been doing, Dan Schmale and I are sort of trying to put a website together on neurohistory. I'm very interested in the metaphors, not that I want to import neuroscience, and maybe I shouldn't even bring this up because it'll probably just start a, open a whole new can of worms. Um, I'm very interested in the metaphors of human behavior that we can get from reading in neuroscience because I think it's sort of changing our vision this is my interpretation anyway, of how the self works. So what I, I, my complaint about Foucault and in, in, in post-structuralism generally is that it tends towards an effacement of the self as an object of interest, S which one could argue parallels certain things that have happened in neuroscience because no one any longer believes the self is located somewhere uh, and exactly what it is is very much up into question, but I'm interested in sort of new metaphors getting away from the language text metaphor for, for cultural history into a more action-oriented, agent-oriented set of metaphors, which I believe resonates with the, some of the interesting work that's being done in neuroscience. Having looked into this a little, however, it's a little discouraging. There are you know 19 articles a day being published on the results of functional magnetic resonance imaging, and that's just one tiny little part of what's going on in neuroscience. So it's not like I'm claiming I'm going to somehow import this into cultural studies. My complaint about Foucault is effacement of the self and the vision that, you know, what modern society is about is discipline. I'm interested in what are the changes that take place in the self-society interaction that mean that you have to have 
discipline in new kinds of ways. So I'm much more interested in the dialectical relationship between what's going on inside of people and society with more attention paid to what's coming from the individual and not just seeing the individual as a creation of discourse, but as an active agent in the making of the social world and therefore as a sort of source of energy that changes the social world as much as it is shaped by the social world. So in, in a word, I'm interested in kind of getting away from the carceral into a view that emphasizes more new sources of energy in relationship to the world that make possible revolution and a whole variety of other things. No? <laughs> uh, Jeremy Crickler, History Department. Um, I, I sort of felt that uh, there was a tension between your um, arguments, um, but uh, maybe it's, you know, you'll resolve it very easily. And what, what it was, was I was struck by Lynn saying, uh, you know, a very important question is, why is the global important to the, to the local? That's, uh, you know, wh why is it that, you know, it's, they bound up with, with each other? Um, but that followed a critique from Linda about uh, what you called, um, you know, the large-scale macho, macro processes uh, that you, um, you know, that you, you felt were, were being given too much prominence. Um, but in fact, I don't see how uh, one can be uh, explaining why the, the global, the wider world is, uh, is relevant to the, to the local, unless you are specifically looking at the um, local manifestations of these very large scale processes which will be migration, technological binding up of you know, areas with, with, each, with each other, um, uh, the question of financial flows, uh, connections between, between people and, and so on. And what that seems to suggest is that um, you know, one, one can't uh, simply look at what does the globalization paradigm mean in terms of connections uh, or the fact that there's a transnational uh, impact of, of something. What one is, is looking for, um, I, I think, is um, the point at which uh, the, the world uh, is being you know, subject to corresponding dynamics, you know, things such as decline of the peasantry, you know, my various migratory flows, the way in which technology, I mean, you mentioned the internet, but uh, you were then mentioning print earlier on. And I, I don't see how, how one can possibly, um, you know, have a meaningful globalization paradigm that is not um, centrally, uh, you know, pivot, that, that doesn't pivot upon technology, technological development, the very ability to think of the world in, in global terms uh, that are actually very, very large scale. And I was, I was rather um, disappointed by the, uh, you know, what, what, I, what I thought was a kind of diminution of that in your commentary about, you know, these processes being the kind of province of macho historians. And I think, uh, I think one, one has to be one actually has to give much more respect to those processes than uh, I feel that that joke, you know, implies. I was arguing for the importance of collecticism. Um, of course, um, it goes without saying, it should go without saying, and I did make that clear, that um, yes, global history has got to look at spreads of technology uh, transmission of knowledge, invention of new knowledges, huge migrations of people, both voluntary and false, because both are important, uh, the processes of war and empire. Um, the point I was trying to make, and of course I was making it facetiously, was that you can choose to discuss these mega processes which are vital in different ways. They don't all have to be looked at as great 
abstract processes where the individual is completely lost. You can do it different ways, and that's the only thing that I really wanted to stress, the importance of different historians doing things in different ways. For example, um, Joyce Chaplin has recently published a book about circumnavigation of the globe over the centuries. Um, and she is partly a historian of science and a historian of the maritime. Uh, she, she has been on ships a lot herself. So uh, a lot of the book is about navigational techniques, spreads of knowledge, the invention of new machines, uh, scientific discoveries. Um, but she also pins down her analysis at times, and this is a lot of her raw material, with individual narratives of circumnavigations and, and what this can tell us about uh, how different people, and they're mainly men until the 19th century, uh, how did they see circumnavigation? What, and, and what were the, the consequences? And that's really all I was saying, that, that this is one way of doing it. Uh, global history, because the modern phase of global <coughs> history writing, it's, it's always been around, but the modern phase is, is really just beginning. All I was suggesting was that we need to explore different techniques, different strategies. Uh, historians need to follow their particular interests w within that area, that huge area. Also, I think it's important to keep in mind something that you explicitly brought up at the beginning, which I think is extremely important, which is that globalization as a phenomenon is not new. So the question is, why is it on the agenda now? So you know, one could argue, obviously it goes through different forms, and there has to be a history, in a way, of globalization. But one of the things I've always been, that I've been interested in is, why does it become such a big deal for discussion in, starting in the 1990s? I'm, uh, to me, it seems pretty obvious that it cannot be coincidental with the fall of the Soviet Union. So you, you, you don't have Cold War ideology in which communism or ca versus capitalism is the issue. You have globalization. And so then th there are all kinds of, for me, really interesting ideological questions about is it an ideological move to talk about globalization? Clearly, it is in the process, I tried to make that clear, that of revealing important truths about our history that we overlooked because we weren't thinking about it. But it's also true that it's not as if globalization happened in 1989 or 1991. And so it also is something about why are we thinking about the world in these terms? What does it mean to us that we are now wanting to think about it? the world in these terms. And it, it is clearly the case, and I think Linda sort of mentioned this, if not explicitly, implicitly, that part of that is a kind of revival of modernization on the Western model kind of language. And that I think we have to be, we have to be critical of. I, I, I try to make it clear that it's not that I'm opposed to the idea of the interest in globalization. I think it points in, however, a whole lot of different directions and different, different ways of approaching it. Obviously, technology is very important, but also what's very important is why do certain technologies arrive, arise at certain times? I think this is a really interesting question. So I'm interested more in the where does the desire for it come from rather than the it falls from the sky and changes our lives kind of view of it. Celani can sociological department. We didn't hear a thing. We didn't hear a thing. Sorry, Celani can sociological department. I would like to go back to the revolution and its relationship with the global context. I had the idea that the research interest of modern historians is strictly connected to the current interest of the. So history is supposed uh, to help us to understand what is going on now. So to help us uh, to understand the presence. Uh, taking this into account, and the model of uh, the global history. Uh, how should we uh, understand what is going on in Syria, for example, or what has happened in Libya? I mean, their so-called revolutions. 
and uh, do need to look at the global context and to, glo and to global institutions and to um, transnational uh, players. Um, and what will be your suggestions? Thank you. <laughs> Libya was never a US colony. That's all I can say. No. Um, I'm sure there are people in the room who are way better placed to answer this question than I am. <laughs> and I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> We're all, we're, all, we're all right, Linda. We've got it organised. Kathy's going to consult with. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Do we have some further questions? If, if, if there aren't, can I say that there will be plenty of opportunity for further discussion outside, certainly within. We've got a reception outside. Um, Lin Linda has to leave us to catch her train. I think we're, we're fine, Linda, actually. It's all right. Kathy's doing it. But can I, um, before you have to dash off, and I think there might be a chance just for a brief chat with people, um, just say on behalf of everyone how enormously grateful we are for you for what was a really memorable afternoon. Thank you so much. Pleasure.